You're listening to BostonFreeRadio.com. Hello and welcome to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic Dan Burke, and I've got five new movies to review for you for this show. Before I get to that, though, let's get, let me get into my usual segment, What's Topping the Box Office? This is the top 10 highest grossing films of this past weekend, usually based on United States receipts, but I also factor in international receipts as well. So it really doesn't come as too much of a surprise to me that the number one movie this week is the same as the number one last week. I thought The Mummy might up outseat Wonder Woman, but turns out not the case. In fact, I, I had my doubts that it would. So turns out my instincts were correct. Wonder Woman is number one again, having grossed $58.5 million at the box office this past weekend. Against a budget of $149 million, which is actually pretty modest for um, a, a, a superhero movie, Wonder Woman grossed, has so far grossed $206.3 million in the United States so far, in its two weeks in release, and $436.5 million around the world, making it a tentative hit here in the United States, but around the world it is already a certified hit. My guess is in about two weeks it'll be certified in the United States as well. Given the positive buzz that's surrounding Wonder Woman, I would not be surprised. And The Mummy did not out upset, outseat, upset, Wonder Woman, but it came very close. It's number two at the box office this weekend, but it is the highest grossing debut movie of the week. The Mummy grossed $31.7 million this weekend in the United States against a budget of $125 million, which means it has a long way to go to recoup its budget in the United States. However, around the world, including in the United States, The Mummy has so far made $173.5 million. That, again, is against a budget of $125 million, which means it's not a hit yet here in the States, but around the world it is already a tentative hit. Captain Underpants, the first epic movie, was number two at the box office last week. This week it's number three at the box office, having grossed a decent $12.2 million. Against a budget of $38 million, though, Captain Underpants has so far grossed $44.4 million in the United States and... $47.2 million around the world, which means in every other country besides the United States, Captain Underpants has so far grossed only $2.8 million. However, here in the United States, it is a tentative hit, and vicariously, around the world, it is also a tentative hit. Pirates of the Caribbean, Dead Men Tell No Tales, was number one at the box office two weeks ago. Last week, it was number three at the box office. This weekend it slides slightly to number four at the box office, having grossed $10.7 million. Against a budget of $230 million, Pirates of the Caribbean, you know the rest, has so far grossed $135.8 excuse me, $135 million here in the United States and $600.5 million around the world. So while it is far away from recouping all its budget here in the States, it may never be a hit in the States. However, already it's a certified hit around the world in just three weeks. Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 is another winner for Disney. In its sixth week in release, it has fallen to number five from number four last week. This week it grossed $6.3 million. Against a budget of $200 million, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 has so far grossed $366.4 million in the United States so far, and around the world it has grossed $833.6 million. Given how well that the Star Wars, uh, Rogue One, the Star Wars film, the last one, did, and how Beauty and the Beast did, I actually am surprised that Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 has not grossed a billion dollars yet around the world. I never thought I'd say I'm surprised that the movie hasn't grossed a billion dollars, but it might in the next couple of weeks, but I wouldn't counter it. Still, it's taken in a lot, having been a tentative hit here in the States and a certified hit around the world. Another debut this week, which is gaining a lot of underground buzz, It Comes at Night, is number six of the box office this weekend, making its debut with $6 million in the United States, and that's against a budget of $5 million. So already in one week, It Comes at Night, thanks to its modest budget, is so far a tentative hit in the United States, 
And while I don't have the international numbers for you right now, it's vicariously a tentative hit around the world as well, at least. Baywatch, in its third week in release, has slid to number seven from number five last week. This movie is looking like a bomb. Baywatch has so far grossed $4.6 million in the United States this past weekend. Against a budget of $69 million, Baywatch has so far grossed $51.1 million here in the States and $98.3 million around the world, which means it's not a hit yet here in the States. Around the world, it's a tentative hit, but I don't exactly know why it's doing as well as it is internationally. My guess is it's probably... Dwayne Johnson's doing, but chances are it's probably not going to merit a sequel, at least I don't think. Megan Levy is the number three highest grossing debut movie of the week, but here in the States, it's number eight at the box office, having grossed $3.8 million. Now, I can't say whether this is not a hit yet, a tentative hit, or a certified hit, because not only do I not have the international numbers, I also don't have the budget for this movie. Maybe I'll get the budget by next week, but right now... I really can't say what kind, of, what kind of hit it is, if it is a hit. Alien Covenant, though, I'm pretty sure you can qualify that as a flop, at least in the United States. It grossed $1.8 million in its fourth week in release. Against a budget of $97 million, Alien Covenant has so far grossed $71.2 million here in the States, and $181.6 million around the world. So around the world, it's a tentative hit now, and probably in the next week or two, it could inch its way up to being a certified hit. But rest assured, it's probably still a disappointment here in the States and internationally because at $71.2 million in just four weeks, it is not a hit. It doesn't look like it's going to recover either. And there probably won't be any other Alien movies after this one. At least I'm speculating. And finally, at number 10 of the box office this weekend is Everything Everything, which hasn't pulled in or hasn't had a distinctive position in the top 10 in its four weeks in release, but it grossed $1.6 million this weekend. Against a budget of $10 million, it has made $31.7 million here in the States. And while I don't have the international numbers for you, I can tell you it is a certified hit here in the States and vicariously a certified hit around the world. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is the newest installment of The Mummy. It's actually a franchise reboot. It's... There have been actually several Mummy reboots. The first one was the Universal Monsters film series that went from 1932 to 1955. The first Mummy movie from 1932 had Boris Karloff playing the Mummy, and I think a few years later, he would later go on to play Frankenstein. And then the Mummy franchise was rebooted in 1959 for the Hammer Horror series, which also produced some Frankenstein and Dracula films as well. Low budget, but still adored by a a certain number of fans. And last but not least, there was also the Stephen Summers series, which started with The Mummy from 1999, which starred Brendan Fraser and Rachel Weisz, and extended through 2008, where there was a Mummy trilogy, a canceled fourth film, and also four Scorpion King spinoff series. The first Scorpion King, which made Dwayne The Rock Johnson probably a matinee idol, came out in 2002, and there were three other Scorpion King movies that all went directly to video and did not have any involvement with Dwayne Johnson. So this installment of The Mummy which is a reboot, as I said, is not only a reboot of The Mummy, but it's also the first installment in what's going to be the Dark Universe film series. Now, what is the Dark Universe? It's a series of films that Universal Studios is rolling out, beginning with The Mummy and continuing with other classic monsters that were were made into films in the 1930s, but which Universal is rebooting into several other films. So as I said, The Mummy is the first of this series, and the next movie will be The Bride of Frankenstein, which is slated to come out, at least according to Wikipedia, on February 14th, 2019. Not 2018, 2019. But anything could happen between now and then. But how is the... Well, first of all, let's talk about what the plot of The Mummy is. And and you'd think you'd know the, the plot from seeing maybe the previews or even 
parts of the 1932 movie starring Boris Karloff, but you'd be wrong. T to this movie's credit, it's a little bit more complicated than just somebody dressed in... I... Well, anyway, I'm, I'm just going to go get into the plot. So it begins in 1127 A.D., where a, a group of English crusader knights from the, the Middle Ages capture a large ruby from ancient Egypt and bury it with them in death. Well, it happens this ruby belonged to a, an Egyptian queen and, well, actually an Egyptian princess, who is awakened from a crypt beneath the desert and brings with her malevolence grown over millennia. That's the tagline from the movie. And terrors that defy human comprehension. So that's the basic plot of The Mummy. So you get a lot of previous exposition about who this mummy is. And for the first time, I don't, I don't think they ever made a female mummy before this. And it's, it's not somebody dressed in white wrapping either. It's, it's a lot more complicated than that. And actually, I am, I'm actually pleasantly surprised that they had a woman play the mummy and that the woman was also scary. In her previous life as an Egyptian princess, she was actually very seductive. And she's actually played by a beautiful young actress by the name of Sophia Butella, who you probably haven't seen in very many other movies, but she's actually going to be in a movie later this summer with, excuse me, with Charlize Theron called Atomic Blonde. So that's a movie I definitely look forward to seeing. But how does she terrorize people in the present day? Well, there's an archaeologist named Nick Morton, who's played by Tom Cruise, who goes into modern day Mesopotamia, which is Iraq, and happens upon the tomb of this Egyptian princess named Amenet. And he discovers the, the ruby that is buried along with these crusading knights, and Amenet comes to life and begins to haunt Tom Cruise's character, and of course wants that ruby back. And she will kill any mortal in her way in order to obtain the ruby. So that's the plot in a nutshell. It turns out that Tom Cruise is not particularly good in this movie. It's not that he acts badly, but it just kind of seems like he's going through the motions. He's playing an archaeologist here who goes to modern-day Mesopotamia to discover uh, a treasure buried by members of the Crusade, which automatically brought to my mind Indiana Jones. As a matter of fact, if this was an Indiana Jones movie and Harrison Ford came in to do this, I think it would have been a much better movie. And even if you absolutely hated Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, I think you might agree with me. But there are some very dubiously realistic action sequences here. And by dubious, dubiously realistic, what I mean is they're not very realistic or convincing at all. One of the most laughable action sequences here is when Tom, or Tom Cruise's character and a number of other characters are on a plane and Tom Cruise's character has the ruby that is Princess Amonette's, and then Amonette summons these birds to crash the plane. Sure enough, they do that, but the, the problem here is that it's not a commercial airline, it's a charter plane, and there are not very many seats on the plane, let alone seat belts. So Nick Morton, Tom Cruise's character, gives the only parachute on the plane to his love interest in the movie, an archaeologist named Jenny Halsey, who's played by Annabelle Wallace. Well, when he does this, the plane is crashing down an admittedly scary sequence, but Tom Cruise is not wearing a seatbelt, and he's not even seated, but the plane crashes, and he ends up still alive anyway. There is no explanation whatsoever how he survived that crash. People thought that Brad Pitt's cr plane crash in World War Z was unrealistic, but at least Brad Pitt was seated and wearing a seatbelt. Here, Tom Cruise has nothing, but he still survives. Welcome back to Words on Film on Boston Free Radio. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. And it turns out I have a lot more to say about The Mummy than I thought I would. I didn't give you my rating for it. 
I was going to continue on about... I actually, turns out I have a lot more to say about this film than I initially thought. I usually dedicate one segment to one film each, but I have more to say, so I'm going to continue. So anyway, in addition to that unrealistic action scene, there, there's nothing really surprising about Tom Cruise's character or basically anyone else in the movie except maybe for Russell Crowe's character. And I'll tell you what his name is in a minute. But Tom Cruise's love interest in this movie is a fellow archaeologist named... Jenny Halsey, who's played by Annabelle Wallace, who is probably one of the most bland love interests that Tom Cruise has ever played up against in any film to date. There were a few unintentionally funny scenes in this film, and there's also a fellow archaeologist in this film who's sort of the right-hand man of Nick Morton, who dies early in the film, and that's not a spoiler. His name is Chris Vale, and he's played by Jake Johnson, who not only is a doppelganger of Oscar Isaac, as I've said before, but he's also one of the main actors in the show New Girl, starring Zoe Deschanel. So here he has some comic relief, but he comes back from the dead to warn Tom Cruise's character about this mummy in sequences that reminded me a little bit too much of an American werewolf in London. And when, when Jonathan Landis's film had those sequences where the dead friend comes back to warn the living friend about supernatural entities, it was original for that film. Here, it just feels like retread, especially since Jake Johnson's character seems to deteriorate the same way that Griffin Dunn's character did in An American Werewolf in London. Also, I could, I could tell that this dark universe was going to build itself up to be one of those franchise movies where it's building up to one film where all the, the creatures in a given universe are going to come together and do something when Russell Crowe's character is introduced as Dr. Henry Jekyll. Now, this movie takes place in modern day, I might add, but... From the way that Tom Cruise's character reacted to Russell Crowe's character being named Dr. Henry Jekyll, I could immediately tell this is taking place in a universe where Robert Louis Stevenson did not write Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. However, unlike the novel and the subsequent movies of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, in this movie, Dr. Jekyll has Mr. Hyde take over him when he doesn't want to and has to take drugs to subside his inner um, Edward Hyde. Whereas in the book and in some of the movies, Henry Jekyll actually takes drugs to transform into Mr. Hyde. So one of the letdowns of this movie is, yeah, there's a buildup to Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Whether or not Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde is going to get their own separate movie in the Dark Universe franchise has yet to be determined. I think based largely on the success of this movie. But also, when Dr. Henry Jekyll turns into Edward Hyde, it is such a letdown. It basically is Russell Crowe being painted another color. And that's pretty much it. And the fight sequence between him and Tom Cruise that goes on is just not all that thrilling. As I said, I did like the fact that there was a female mummy in it. I did like Sophia Boutella as both a horror queen and a seductress in her earlier life. I thought that worked well. But to make, it, to make this movie into an action movie similar to Mission Impossible or the other films that Tom Cruise has made, such as... I remember the name of the author. I don't remember the character right now. The author is Lee Child. I forgot the name of the character, but bear with me. Jack Reacher. It, to make this film into an action franchise or an action movie like Mission Impossible and the Jack Reacher films, I think was a big mistake. But it almost seemed that when Tom Cruise signed on to the movie, the producers and maybe some vice presidents of marketing at Universal, probably we reworked this to make it into an action film rather than a horror movie. And it should have probably stuck straight to horror. and Maybe mixed a little bit of comedy into it. That, there wouldn't have been anything wrong with that. And I do think the horror elements and the comedy elements worked well in this film. But again, there's an unrealistic scene where Tom Cruise's character probably should have died but not only did he not die, he also didn't get a scratch on him. And also, 
there were moments where this Princess Aminette could have offed Nick Morton, Tom Cruise's character, but there was a plot contrivance where she can't. And yet, despite this fact, and it's really hard to explain, in fact, I couldn't even understand it myself, but despite this fact, th she's still haunting Nick Morton. It just doesn't make any sense to me. And also, when there are spirits who are looking for a certain gem or a certain series of rocks, why do they want to kill the person who has the rock? Don't they have enough powers so that they can bring themselves back to life, take the rock from the person by force, and then rest peacefully? That was the same problem with last year's movie, The Darkness, starring Kevin Bacon, which was on my list of one of the worst films of the year. So unfortunately, The Mummy tried, but it's not a good start for this Dark Universe movie that Universal Studios wants to push. I am interested in seeing the upcoming Bride of Frankenstein movie that is still in the works right now, but The Mummy gets my rating of a strikeout. It's a movie that has some decent action, but it's action we've seen before, and the stuff we haven't seen before is completely implausible and takes you right out of the movie. I, while I thought Tom Cruise would be an asset to this film, unfortunately he's a liability because from being an action hero in the other previous franchises he's done, like Mission Impossible and Jack Reacher, he's going through the motions here. And he should probably change his mindset of being the star of an action movie and instead try to find a different mindset for being the star of a horror film. That's what he should have done here. It's what he didn't do. And it didn't help that all the other characters in this movie were either bland or pretty much misplaced. And it's really a shame because this movie did have a lot of potential. It had a potential to be a different movie than the Mummy movie from 1999. But unfortunately, it failed in a lot of those instances. And the fact that we have a new Mummy doesn't help too much. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Megan Levy. It's a movie with a title that is somewhat unassuming, and unless you're looking at the poster or maybe even watching the preview, you probably wouldn't know that this is a movie about a soldier in the Iraq War, a Marine to be more specific. And to this movie's credit, it tells the story that's rarely told in movies about soldiers who fight in foreign wars. That is, stories about female soldiers. Although, understandably, women weren't allowed to fight in wars, at least w without a disguise, until the Persian Gulf War of 1991. So obviously a lot has changed in just a couple of years, or 20 or 30 years. But in any event, this is the first movie that I know of that details a female soldier fighting the Iraq War. But the kicker of this movie is it's not just about her. And that's where I think the movie was mislabeled. It is based on the true life story of a young Marine corporal named Megan Levy, whose unique discipline and bond with her military combat dog saved many lives during their deployment in Iraq. So it's about her and her combat dog. And there was a movie that made three years ago about a dog, a, a military combat dog, and the movie and the dog were named Max. It wasn't a great movie, but it was pretty decent, and it made for a good family movie that was not only a, a war movie in a sense, but it also somehow made fit itself in pretty well with other movies about life-saving dogs like the Lassie franchise and the Benji franchise. But here, it's not only a story about a woman Marine, it's also about her dog, which made me think that maybe a better name for this movie could have just simply been a Marine and her dog. I would have seen that. But anyway... Yeah, the, the real-life woman is named Megan Levy. In this movie, she's played by Kate Mara, and it pretty much brings you from her humble beginnings in a small town in New York to her enlisting in the Marines and eventually getting herself in trouble after going through basic training and being reduced to cleaning out the stalls of military combat dogs in training at her military base. So... 
under the guidance of a military high-ranking officer named Gunny Martin, who in this movie is played by Common, Megan Levy, again Kate Mara, begins to train and ultimately be in combat with a military combat dog whose name I temporarily forgot. But anyway, this dog is insubordinate at first and is more aggressive than necessary. In other words, for someone who's undergoing military training, this dog is decidedly undisciplined. So Megan Levy is brought under the watch of this dog, or rather the dog is under her watch to be properly trained for Iraq. And when they get to Iraq, this dog's job is not, is not only to attack enemies when necessary, but also primarily to sniff out bombs and underground mines. So there are some pretty compelling scenes from the beginning of this movie up until the end, even without the military combat dog, who I think is a German Shepherd. I'm not entirely sure, but you can look at the poster and figure that one out for yourself. But the point is that the bond between this girl, this woman, rather, and this dog is something that I, I don't think can be faked. I think that Kate Morrow works very well with this dog, and I think that's a testament not only to her really good acting skills, but also probably the person who was training the dog for this movie, the fact that they got along so well. And there are some pretty intense action sequences here. You wouldn't think sniffing out bombs would be intense, but this movie makes it so. And there's also one scene where the dog misses a bomb. Granted, it's not entirely the dog's fault, but the blast that happens in the scene I won't give away, or at least not entirely, but it, it made me wonder how the real soldier, Kate Mara, survived this blast without losing any of her limbs. So this is a war movie, undoubtedly. It feels a lot more realistic than a movie that came out a couple of months ago called The Wall, which starred Aaron Taylor Johnson and John Cena. There are a lot fewer contrivances in this movie than there was in The Wall, probably because Megan Levy is based on a true story about an actual Marine and her dog. But the movie is even more compelling when at the end, in the third act, when Megan Levy actually retires from the Marines, she desires to take this military combat dog and have him as her own. Now, the reasoning behind not having a dog that's trained for combat is pretty well explained here. In fact, the character who's played by Colin here, um, whose, whose character's name is Gunny Martin, actually states that there were some military combat dogs who were brought home to the States, and because of similar post-traumatic stress disorder that these dogs had, similar to humans, there was one instance where there was a boy who, who was holding a toy gun and ended up losing the hand in which he was holding the toy gun. Yeah, so a lot of... There are some precarious scenarios which the movie does address but i'm not going to give away whether megan levy gets the dog or not but her separation anxiety from the dog felt incredibly realistic especially for anyone who's owned a dog or had a dog as a pet like myself there is nothing sad there's very few things sadder than either a dog dying or a dog being taken away from a family. So I think that movie communicates this very well. In terms of its war scenes, they feel, feel more realistic, but I don't feel like they had the hellish nature of other better films. So for that reason, it gets my rating of a high checkout. It's a film that might not have the war scenes stay with you, but I thought Kate Mara acted well in this movie. I thought supporting performances by the likes of Tom Felton, Common, and Edie Falco were really good as well.
Welcome back to Words on Film on Boston Free Radio. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. Words on Film is the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. And I usually use my seven and a half minute segments to review one movie at a time. But I ran overtime with my review of The Mummy. And I wanted to get everything in to that movie that I had to say. So consequently, I'm going to dedicate this break to reviewing two movies back to back. And they're both independent films. The first one is My Cousin Rachel, which is a movie that stars Rachel Weisz, Sam Claffin, and Holiday Granger, amongst other... A correction on that name. His name is Sam Claflin, and he's a young British actor. But this is a movie that is actually based on a novel written by Daphne du Maurier. And Daphne du Maurier was a woman who lived... From actually quite comparatively recently, she was born in 1907 in London, England, and died in 1989. And so, this movie takes place in the Victorian era, probably the 1800s. And it's about a young Englishman who initially plots revenge against his mysterious, beautiful cousin, believing that she murdered his guardian. But his feelings become complicated as he finds himself falling under the beguiling spell of her charms. When I first read this plot synopsis last week, I immediately thought, incest. Well, it turns out that this cousin of the young Englishman, and the young Englishman's name, by the way, is Philip, and he's played by Sam Claflin, as I stated, was raised not by a mother and father, but by his older cousin, a man, um, after his parents perished. So when he became of age, he moved back to his house, but his older cousin actually moved out and married a woman in Italy by the name of Rachel. So this cousin is his cousin by marriage and not by bloodline, thank God. Because otherwise, this movie would be a lot creepier. But it turns out from the letters that, his cousin, that Philip's cousin writes to him, he gives off the impression that Rachel is a, a freeloader or a deceitful woman who is only after Philip's cousin for his money. Now, you're only told this through letters, so you're not exactly sure if this is Philip's cousin's paranoia speaking, if he has paranoia, or if he's really telling the truth. So initially, you get the impression that Philip absolutely hates this cousin by marriage, Rachel Ashley, and you'd be correct. Well, eventually his cousin dies, it's said from a brain tumor, and Rachel goes from Italy to England, to this English abbey, to collect her inheritance, or rather, her part of the will. And of course, Philip is very suspicious of Rachel until he actually meets her. And as you might expect, Rachel Ashley in this movie is played by the wonderful Rachel Weiss. So you're not exactly sure what to think of Rachel, Uh, Very much, very similar to how Philip feels about her. And Philip is a young man. He's 24 when you first meet him, and he eventually turns 25. And I guess in England, at the legal age of 25, he's able to collect his cousin's inheritance. I really got to wrap this this thing up, this review up very quickly. But other than the fact that this movie, I, I think, has been misadvertised, especially in the posters, where you see Rachel Weiss's face covered by a veil, and you, you have a lot of dark colors, so it looks like she's either attending a funeral or waking up from the grave. And there were, are some times where she actually attends a funeral in this film, but the poster makes this film seem like a horror movie, which might attract the wrong audience and have that wrong audience be disappointed. But I thought the acting in this film was good. I thought Sam Cleflin very well displayed a a range of very hard emotions to reflect in a movie, but he does that very well. And Rachel Weisz plays charming extremely well, but you're looking at her and you're thinking, is there something going on beneath the surface? I think this movie had a decent effect on me. I think I was thrown off by the way it was its subject matter was implied, but I give it my rating of a checkout because I thought the performances were good and the plot was indeed intriguing. In addition to that, 
the um, the ending was a big shocker, and I won't give that away right now. Instead, I'll review my next film, which is Band Aid. Band Aid is a movie that has been directed by, written by, and starring an actress named Zoe Lister Jones. Band Aid is not a movie about the supergroup put together by Bob Geldof in the early '80s to fight world hunger. It's about a married couple played by Zoe Lister-Jones and Adam Pally, who can't stop fighting, but they embark on a last-ditch effort to save their marriage, which is turning their fights into songs and starting a band. So this is a movie that is labeled a comedy, but there are a lot of really hard parts to watch in this film. There were a few parts that actually made me laugh, but it was when the two of them got together and formed the band where I thought the most enlightened and the most refreshing scenes took place, not to mention the bigger laughs. Seeing them bicker before they decided to start the band, and maybe even a little while after, was unpleasant to watch, but there were times in the beginning of the film where you thought that, the move, that there'd be funnier scenes between the two of them, but unfortunately, their chemistry didn't really start going until they started this band in the film. But once they started the band, they started writing songs reflecting their grievances in their marriage. That's where I thought the film really started to find its footing. But I commend this movie for being made by a female director. As I said, you know, when women direct movies and they direct them well, that, of course, has to be better commended probably than when a man does it, which is I'm just I'm going to zip my lips before I I get into this per particularly but anyway this movie has a few famous faces in it one of the most famous is Fred Armisen who plays a quirky neighbor who becomes the drummer for this band so I don't have a lot to say about it. I only have a few more seconds, but it gets my rating of a checkout. I do think it's a very original plot. I do think that when Zoe Lister-Jones and Adam Pally, even when they fight, they, they still have a chemistry together that makes you think that they have been married. But uh, according to my research, I don't think they actually have. But it's still a good original movie. It could have had a few more laughs, but the songs are great. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Paris Can Wait, which is also, well, its original title was Bonjour Anne, but it's a movie about the wife of a successful movie producer, and the wife is played by Diane Lane, the movie producer is Alec Baldwin, who takes a car trip from the south of France to Paris with one of her husband's associates. This is a movie that's most notable as b for being directed and written by Eleanor Coppola. And Eleanor Coppola is the wife of Francis Ford Coppola, but she's making her directorial debut of a non-documentary feature. I believe she had some hand in directing Heart of Darkness, which was the movie about Francis Ford Coppola's trials and tribulations and making the movie Apocalypse Now. But she made Paris Can Wait at the age of 81. Making her directorial debut at the age of 81, that is astonishing. So those of you people out there who think, you know, you're past your prime because you're not in your 20s and you still have that dream of making a movie and think you're too old, I think you can use Eleanor Coppola as an example of it's never too, it's never too late to make a movie unless you're dead. So anyway, so Paris Can Wait is, by extension, a road trip movie. It is Diane Lane's character being given a tour of the probably overlooked corners of France with a hospitable man by the name of Jacques, who's played in this movie in a star-making performance by Arnaud, Arnaud Viard. Forgive me for mispronouncing that, but Arnaud Viard is an actor I don't think I've seen in many other films, but he's been in several movies over the last 24 years, most of them French. I think this is his debut in an American movie, and what a debut, because initially you, he's, his character is offering, rather than just take Diane Lane's character to the airport, just offering actually to drive her not only to Paris, but also showing her various sites along the way. 
So you're thinking, is this Frenchman actually being cordial and courteous? Or is he trying to hit on Diane Lane? Because let's face it, she is, of course, Diane Lane. In other words, she is a woman who is 52 years old and still looks amazing. She probably has looks that 99% of other women in their 50s would undoubtedly envy, and for good reason. The problem is that Diane Lane's character, of course, in this film is married to Alec Baldwin's character. But I do think that Alec Baldwin's presence in this film presents a problem. Alec Baldwin has, over the last couple of years, been in many comedic movies, and the dramatic movies he's been in, he's kind of taken that comedic persona with him. And but by that I mean, you're used to seeing him on shows like 30 Rock, and for that matter, this past season of Saturday Night Live, playing a pompous jerk. So whenever he's in a movie nowadays, he almost kind of seems to take that pompous jerk persona with him. So I think the consequence of Alec Baldwin being in this movie is, I didn't exactly find myself hoping that Diane Lane wouldn't have an affair with her, on, her on-screen counterpart throughout most of the film. Granted, Arnaud Viard is not a particularly good-looking guy, but he is very charismatic, and I can certainly understand how or if certain women would fall for him. But there are instances in this film where it's implied that Alec Baldwin's character may or may not have had several affairs over the course of his marriage to Diane Lane's character. So those are revealed eventually through uh, this movie. And I actually think one of the assets of this film is there's one instance where Arnard Viard's character tells Diane Lane about one encounter that Alec Baldwin's character had with a young lady who wanted to be in one of his films. And there's a certain thing that Alec Baldwin does to this young woman, according to Arnaud Viard's character. The look on Diane Lane's face when given this information spoke volumes. So I thought that Diane Lane did a good job, not only being in a movie with some beautiful panoramic shots and almost a movie that you could argue is a dramatized tourist film. Although if more tourist films were made like this, I, I think people would, I, I, I think France's tourism department would be entirely thankful. But also she plays a lot of different emotions in this film that are more varied than you'd expect from a movie called Paris Can Wait. So by the time this movie ends, Diane Lane's character does make it to Paris, but the fate of her and, um, well, I'm just going to say the character's name, Jacques, is curious. And I'll, I'll just say that without spoiling very much. But I did think that Paris Can Wait's biggest asset was its on-location shooting. I thought the... Par it made the Paris countryside look beautiful, which, granted, it, it probably is, but, uh, of course, had a, it took advantage of a lot of those great shots. I thought that Diane Lane and Arnard Viard had incredible chemistry together. I would like to see Arnard Viard get some sort of accolades for his role in this film. I can't exactly say whether or not He'll be nominated for something months down the road. It's not Oscar season yet. It's very early in the year, but I really did like him, and I'm going to look out for him in any other movies in in the future, especially if it's an American film, because a lot of French films don't come my way, let's face it. But Paris Can Wait gets my rating of a knockout because I think it's a joyous film to watch. Alec Baldwin was slightly miscast, but I did think that Diane Lane, what Alec Baldwin lacked, Diane Lane and Arnard Viard probably more than made up for by starring in this film together and having such great 
on-screen chemistry. And I definitely recommend it either at theaters or video on demand. And now that I've reviewed all the movies I need to review for this show, I'm going to get into what's topping the box office. The top 10 highest, or rather top 10, not even top 10. It's the movies that are coming out this coming weekend. And there are a number of big ones, beginning pro with the movie that's probably going to be number one at the box office. And it, if it doesn't abdicate, or rather if Wonder Woman doesn't abdicate its number one spot, then this movie will definitely be number two. And it is Cars 3. This is the, uh, I guess, long-awaited sequel to the Cars franchise. But as I remember, a lot of people weren't especially excited about Cars 2. A lot of people regard that as the quote-unquote worst of the Pixar films. But to be honest with you, being the worst Pixar film is like calling Ringo the worst Beatle. First of all, that's subjective. And secondly... Ringo was a Beatle, not to mention one of the greatest rock and roll drummers of all time. So my point is that the quote-unquote worst Pixar film is still pretty good and probably better than 95% of other Animation Studios movies, be it DreamWorks, Blue Light Studios, Illumination. I think Illumination would kill to have one movie be as good as any Pixar film. So Cars 3 has some thing going for it, but in this installment of Cars, Lightning McQueen, who's voiced by Owen Wilson, is back and sets out to prove to a new generation's generation of racers that he's still the best race car in the world. So in this movie, unlike in the original Cars, Lightning McQueen is not a rookie. He is a seasoned veteran car. So... Voice talent in this movie includes Owen Wilson. I think Larry the Cable Guy comes back for this one. And it also features the voices of Chris Cooper, Nathan Fillion, and the main antagonist of this movie that I know of, Army Hammer, who plays the new rookie in this, um, in this NASCAR-like race. So I'm excited to see Cars 3. I don't anticipate that it will be better than any of the Toy Story movies or any of the Monsters Incorporated movies, but I do anticipate to see it and have a good time, and I'll let you know when I do next week. Another movie that's coming out is one called Rough Night. This is a bachelorette party movie. It's about things going terribly wrong for a group of girlfriends who hire a male stripper for a bachelorette party in Miami. So this movie looks like a female hangover, probably more so than Bridesmaids was. And to call Bridesmaids a hangover for women is probably insulting to Bridesmaids because I actually thought it was a better movie than any of the hangover films. But anyway, Rough Night stars Scarlett Johansson, Kate McKinnon, Zoe Kravitz, Jillian Bell, and Ilana Glazer, the latter of whom is on a show on Comedy Central whose the name escapes me, but I think she also co-wrote this movie. But either way, it looks like it's got a really good cast, especially Kate McKinnon, who's usually very funny. And Jillian Bell is also really funny, too, in just about everything she's in. But I don't know if this is going to be a chick flick. I mean, considering the stars of it are chicks, it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be a chick flick, but I'll see it for myself, and I'll let you know what I think. Another big movie that's coming out is a movie called All Eyes on Me. This is the first long-awaited biopic of Tupac Shakur, who in this movie is played by a relative newcomer named Demetrius Ship Jr., who, as I've seen from some of the movie posters, bears a striking resemblance to Tupac Shakur. But th this is interesting. It's, it's a movie that's been held up since 2011 due to litigation between the project's main production company, and Tupac's mother, who's still alive, Afini Shakur. But I am really interested to see how this movie is. Will it be as good as Straight Outta Compton? I can't exactly say. That is a very, very tough act to follow in terms of hip-hop biopics. I think that's probably set the bar so high you could probably drive a truck underneath it. But I'm going to see all eyes on me. Hopefully it's good. I'll let you know whether or not it is when I see the film next week. And the last film I'm going to mention is one called 47 Meters Down, which is about two sisters vacationing in Mexico who are trapped in a shark cage at the bottom of the ocean. 
With less than an hour of oxygen left and great white sharks circling nearby, they must fight to survive. Now, I'm not, I shouldn't negate this movie already, but it looks to me like a ripoff of Jaws. So I don't have high expectations of this movie, but this is another movie I will see, and I'll let you know what I think when I see it. Meanwhile, that just about wraps things up with this week's edition of Words on Film. I'll be back next week to view, review five films, four of which are probably playing in a theater near you. And this is your, well, just un, until you hear from me next week, I am your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, saying, as usual, I'll see you at the movies.